uh, but I'm going to be starting with a guide. So welcome to the Prophecy of Pandora guide. I'm going to try and cover as many aspects as possible. As you can see, we are super late game into the Prophecy of Pandora. Uh, because I almost conquered the entirety of the world using my strategies. Uh, the only one left is Torba, standing. As you can see, it's full on lords and troops, so it's going to be a bitch to take. But hopefully, my guide is going to help you uh, go and conquer the entire world. So for starters, I'm going to be talking about the character. We are at level 42. So, uh, the best build path when you're starting the game to min-max your stats. Uh, what I feel like you need to go, when you're asked about your father figure, you go and get yourself a mysterious figure. So, he was a mysterious and unknown figure that helped you. Um, you go, in the second option, you choose uh, your father left you to fend for yourself. Third option, you became a bard. And fourth option, you go for a series of unfortunate events. Now, why do we go for these choices? Because you'll receive seven into looting from level one. And that's going to kickstart your early game quite a lot. I'll also have to move the camera around from uh, the stats. I just noticed that you guys can't see them. So give me a sec. I'm going to move that camera over here. There we go. And we're going to go back. So, that should be better. Uh, no, I do not want to modify my face. So, the main reason you're going for these choices is you'll receive 7 into looting. And you'll receive a decent amount of leadership, uh, persuasion, and prisoner management. And what I recommend you doing early game from level 1 is you need to prioritize your stats... And you will need to practically build your guy to become a king. So I prioritize to take my agility to 18. So I'll have writing of at least 6. Writing of 6 will unlock some of the best horses in the game for you. And another reason is you can further upgrade your looting if you so wish to, but I just feel like 7 into looting uh, from level 1 is enough for the entirety of the game, so I just leave it at that. Uh, next, I'm going to be upgrading the strength to 21. So as you level up, I keep pumping into points in agility till 18, and then strength up until 21. That's going to make you decently powerful against most, uh, most of the enemies that you're going to be facing. Uh, keep on putting points into power strike as much as possible. Uh, you would with 21 strength, you'll have uh, seven into power strike, and that's going to enable you to wear very, very good armor as the game goes on. Uh, afterwards, after you have 21 into strength, go ahead and put 21 into charisma. Uh, when you're going to have your own kingdom, you will need a shit ton of leadership. So, for starters, bring that charisma to 21. Uh, increase the leadership up to 7, increase persuasion up to 7, and if you so like it, increase prisoner management up to 7 because that is going to increase the chance of you capturing unique spawns. Um, nope, not really Surf Jam. You just receive uh, higher chances of um, getting better loot and a, a lot more loot as looting skill increases. Uh, once you have uh, 21 into Charisma, just dump the rest of the points into Intellect, because with the Intellect, you will be focusing on Surgery. It's very important uh, to lessen your casualties. This is increases the chance of people, instead of dying, they're gonna survive and continue on fighting for you. Hello, Victor Ann. Welcome to the stream, good sir. I'm doing a quick guide right now, so give me a sec. Uh, you need to focus into pathfinding to make you faster on the field of battle. Tactics to give you more troops than the enemy, even if you're against a higher number odds. So, for example, if you're um, having a party of 100 and you're fighting against 200, tactics will, give, uh, will bring the battle advantage in your favor and give you more troops on the field of battle. And a trainer, which is very important for all of your characters. Trainer is the only skill that stacks and this helps train your army much, much faster. Now, other skills that you need to prioritize, I recommend putting at least six points into writing 
if you want to go for a mounted uh, mounted build or six points into athletics if you want to go on foot put at least four points into shield um four points is kind of the sweet spot you'll be able to have one of some of the best shields out there uh weapon master as much as possible i really love having this and then as i said once you reach the point of intellect you focus on surgery pathfinding tactics and trainer adjust your inventory management as you see fit i feel like four is a good good point but for the early and mid game just two or three is enough okay uh trade uh, a lot of people might ask me about this trade don't go into trade in prophecy of pandora it's not worth becoming a merchant uh you can just find leslie who can be your trader for your party if you so wish to but i personally have some other plans with leslie uh, she's one of your companions and we're going to talk about companions a little bit later but now you're asking um i did go for agility 18 strength 21 charisma 21 and then everything else into intellect but i have 28 28 strength 25 agility and 30 charisma how did i do that well the the mod will have achievements that you can unlock which will add to charisma they'll add to leadership they'll add to stuff uh, you can also read books that will increase your skills but the most important way of upgrading your skills beyond the, the thresholds that i've mentioned is elixirs of hackon there's a book peddler inside of the game that will provide you with elixirs of hackon in exchange for Qualis Gems. Now, Qualis Gems, we're going to be talking about them in the weapons section. Um, so we're going to get back on that. But what Elixirs of Hakon do, they will increase strength, agility, and charisma by two points. So you'll re you're going to be receiving six points um, by drinking one of such Elixirs. Um, after three, after you drink three elixirs, you're going to be receiving diminishing returns. So just one into strength, one into agility, one into charisma. And I feel they're not actually worth drinking afterwards. Just the first three are sexy and they'll increase your strength quite a bit. And I think you're going to be good to go. Another streamer mentioned horse archery. A level one is plenty for any build, I guess. The idea here is you can modify you can modify the build as you see fit. I went for a mounted sword and board build. I feel that's the most comfortable for me. But you can modify. When you're putting points into strength, you can instead put points into power draw and just specialize in being a very good archer. Or um, since you already have 18 um, agility, you can uh, pump up your horse archery and you can modify your character that way so you do have leeway of modifying i'm just telling you exactly what's the best way i found of building my character uh but still that doesn't matter as a leader you'll need you'll need um leadership high persuasion high prisoner management is very good and then when you start pumping intellect surgery pathfinding uh trainer and tactics you can also opt uh pathfinding for um you can also uh, decide that pathfinding should be um the role of pathfinder should go to one of your companions that shouldn't be a problem but i think i covered everything for the character creation uh does warband have visual 3d battling yes papa sasquash it has and i'm going to be showing it to you so this is the world map let's now talk about our companions so our companions um the companions are elite troops they won't won't die uh they'll always be uh, wounded in battle in case they lose a battle they will never die and you can upgrade level them up and modify them as you see fit uh some uh, some of the boys some of the companions are okay they communicate all right with other companions some of them hate each other so be be aware of that now you'll need to cover certain aspects if you want to go about this if you you have two decisions to make actually you can either decide on making some of your companions lords once you create your own kingdom or you could just upgrade them to becoming super super human soldiers beasts in your army what i do i do both i both make them companion lords because some of the companion lords are very very loyal to you and they're not going to bitch a lot about your decisions as you run your empire keep that in mind 
And I also keep some companions on my side. So guys, if you want to grab a pen and paper, I'm also going to try to put some uh, um, wording on screen when I'm gonna we're gonna gonna be mentioning this. We have two parties: an initial party uh, where we're gonna be gathering all of the companion lords that we're gonna be making. So we're gonna specialize them into becoming vassals to rule our kingdom with us. And those um, very suitable companion lords are these. Bodice, Diev, Frederick, Julia. Oh, sorry, sorry. Diev is, is not a lord. My bad. Let me let me start that over. <laughs> so, Bodice, Frederick, Julia, Cavera, Lethal Durin, Sir Jocelyn, and Sir Roland. Okay, so these are seven lords that you can create, and you'll not have problems. Now, some of you are thinking, but wait, Lethal Durin has a uh, cunning personality. I can't make him into a lord. Actually, yes, you can. If you just give him three fiefs, he will not bitch afterwards about who receives what. So keep that in mind. Uh, so again, uh, the lords are Bodice, Frederick, Julia, Cavera, Lethal Durin, and Sir Jocelyn. The reason being, they have positive personalities. Uh, besides that, they also receive unique units. Bodice will be fielding Vicavi units, Frederick will be fielding Menheim, Julia will be fiel fielding Empire, Cavera, I don't exactly remember what she's fielding, but she's fielding some good troops. Lethal Durin will be fielding Noldor troops, the Elves, which is fucking awesome and so on and so forth. Now, what do we need to keep in mind when we're leveling a companion to become a vassal for your faction? Uh, there are three main things that you need to give a companion to be a very good vassal. One of them, give them strength. In auto-cal, when it auto-calculates the battles, uh, strength will be mandatory. Uh, they're they're going to... Uh, the auto calculation will take in consideration your strength, your troop size, and the quality of your troops. So keep that in mind. Uh, the next thing that you need to go for is bring them to 21, 21 charisma and give them leadership up to 7. That's going to increase their army size. And I think 21 into charisma is a sweet spot for them. And they shouldn't need to go beyond leadership. And the last aspect that you need to give them is pathfinding. Pathfinding will make them run around the map much, much faster. Um, I think as I did my research, I think those were the only three requirements, uh, three things that actually matter for your um, lords, for your vassals. But if you want to experiment, maybe give them some more training, um, maybe give them some surgery. But as I understand, it doesn't affect their things. At least I didn't notice any change from there. Now... Um, I think we talked enough about companions. Um, I did want to mention uh, another thing, but actually we're going to be talking about that in the kingdom section and in the steps section. So never mind, we're going to get it back on that later. Now let's talk about the intellect companions. Uh, yes, Zaxxon, that is true. You should give them... Th uh, if you have a cunning lord in your service, give them three fiefs ASAP before you make an anybody else lords or give anybody else fiefs. So let's talk about uh, some of our intellect companions. So to create an intellect companion, I feel, at least in this mod, just bring them to strength 12 and then dump all of the other stats into intellect. As you can see, Leslie is the medic of my uh, army. And I'm actually going to be mentioning uh, the last four characters from your four part the, for your first party, which are Diev, Sarah the Fox, Sigismund, and Leslie over here. Uh, this is your first party. Um, uh, this is the first party where you'll have all of your companions, uh, lords in training, and uh, these other four characters. Why four? Because these people, Leslie, Diev, Sigismund, and Sarah the Fox, will always remain by your side and you're going to be specializing them to cover the weaknesses of your party. For example, Leslie, we're going to be specializing her into a medic. That's what we did. Uh, just give her uh, 12 into strength and equip her with a, with a crossbow, a sword and a shield, and some bolts. And keep her in the back line as much as possible. Keep her safe. Y12, that's a good sweet spot. It'll give her um, access to better armor. It'll give her access to better equipment. And 
she will be able to handle herself in battle in case she ever goes into battle. And then from there, just put dump everything into intellect and decide in which way you want to specialize that intellect character. We specialize Leslie into surgery, first aid, wound treatment, and I also made her my engineering because of the surplus skill points that we received from intellect. And she's pretty much done. I'm thinking in the next levels, I'm just going to be maxing out some of her other stats, rounding her up, giving her a 10 wound treatment, and maybe, maybe specking a tidbit into trainer. You know, and, and that's it. Leslie is our medic. Now, for the other characters, another type of character that you will want in your party, let's go to Sarah the Fox. And Sarah over here, you have two choices with her. I decided to make her my looter guy, or looting girl in this case. We focused again up to 12 into strength, and then I dumped all of the agility, all of it into agility, just to make her looting number 10. So she's a looter as long as she's alive and she's not looting in our party. She's gonna be giving us that good, good, sweet, sweet cheddar. That good, sweet money. Also, went to Weapon Master 10 in case I ever send her out to train my Knighthood Order. But we're gonna be talking about Knighthood Order later on. Another way to build Sarah, it's a good idea to make her a diplomat. If you give her persuasion, um, this will help them when you send emissaries out, when you send companions out, and, you know, to declare war or to declare peace, they will most likely be able to persuade the kings um, to do whatever the fuck you want. Um, not exactly sure, Surf Jam, but thank you for reminding me. Another reason why, so maybe some people will be thinking, why am I specializing my main character into surgery? Because, um... Your main character will provide for your party uh, some passive bonus skills. Let me show you in the party screen. So, um, Sarah is our looter, but we, because we have 7 into looting, I can provide an extra plus 2 to looting because we have 7. If I upgrade its looting 8 on my main character, I'm going to be able to provide plus 3. So right now we're fielding 12 looting. Another thing, because I'm so well specialized into surgery, I can help Leslie out with a plus three bonus to surgery. That increases and makes my army even stronger to deal with. Pathfinding, we are already the pathfinder of our party. But again, even if we have eight, we are also providing us a bonus of plus three because of our quantity, as you can see. If you have ten into any of the skills, you're going to be able to provide a plus four passive bonus to this skill. Keep in mind. Uh, thank you, Sir Sam, for reminding me about that, about explaining that. Okay, going back to our intellect characters, another intellect character that you would like to invest in would be a tracker or a spotter or a hunter. Uh, the idea here is let's go um, to Siggy, for example. You go, again, put 12 into strength and then dump the rest into intellect. I'm just using Siggy as an example. And you specialize him into pathfinding, spotting, and tracking. And that should be enough. Another um, intellect template that you can go for, again, 12 into strength, dump everything into intellect and make him an engineer and a tactician. That's also another option. But for what I did, I made Leslie the medic, Sarah the looter, Siggy, I, I upgraded him to 30 strength, and he's going to be training my knighthood order because he has some sexy, sexy stats. Uh, because your companions can be useful as trainers for your knighthood order. A lot of people, pardon, a lot of people prefer to send Lethal Durin out, but I like to make Lethal Durin my companion, uh, my vassal lord, because he's going to be fielding the lord troops. Not a lot, but still, decently. And Diev, if you want to make yourself a archer knighthood order, uh, Diev, I specialize them in he being the best archer there is, and I took the role of being Pathfinder and Tracker for my team. Uh, Diev is not here right now uh, inside the list because I already sent him out to train my knighthood order, which we're going to be talking about shortly. Now, uh, what... What uh, party will you be going for after you assign your vassals? 
The party is the following. You go Elisa, Anson, Ediz, Kasim, Riva, Sir Alistair, and Rain. Remember, uh, Leslie, Diev, Siggy, and Sarah will always remain in your party, and this is the second stable party after you've assigned your, va your companions as lords. And you just build them whatever the fuck you want. Uh, I've built, I'm building Elisa, Ediz, Sir Alistair, Kasim, and Sir Rain as being as tanky and as better at combat as possible, while I, while I keep Siggy and the rest of the troops um, as intellect troops. I'm also thinking making of Anson an intellect character. Thinking I'm going, I'm um, gonna go again. Twelve into strength. And we're going to be specializing Anson in, probably I'm going to make him the dedicated Pathfinder for me. So just Pathfinder Tactics tr um, Trainer. Of course, uh, just stack Trainer on as many companions as possible because that's going to bring you um, a lot of upgrades for your troops. So I think that's it for the companions. I don't think I missed anything. It, guys, if I missed any talking about anything, please let me know. Um, the next thing we're going to be talking about is troops, since we've mentioned them. Now, troops, um, you can hire them from any village. You can find mercenary troops inside the taverns. And I'm just going to make uh, some quick recommendations from each faction about what are the best troops out there and what you can utilize. So, looking a tidbit at the map. In the north, uh, since we already conquered, it's going to be a little bit tough. But in the north, you have the Ravenstern. The Ravenstern are specialized in rangers. Uh, they have the best archers, so Ravenstern rangers will be pretty sexy if you want to go for uh, uh, if you want to focus more on archers. Then on the coastline in the west, you'll have the Fearsvein in Javaxholm, Val, and Bay of Vinholm. The Fearsvein are the Nords from the Nathan game. They have the best infantry. Uh, their Huskarls are pretty goddamn strong, so they have good, good infantry. In the central area, in Sarleon, Laria, Marleon, and Avendor, you'll see the Swadian. Well, sorry, the Sarleon faction. Uh, they're the Swadians from the the um, initial game, and they have very good mounted units. I personally did not find their mounted units that good. I would recommend if you want some mounted units, just go for go for some mercenary cavalry. Seriously, mercenary cavalry is pretty fucking decent. To the southeast, we have whoa, no, 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 no. Hopefully, it won't happen again. Okay, I did not want to move. That's for damn sure. I moved by mistake. There we go. Uh, so to the southwest, we have the Empire. These are the Rodox from the native game. They have the best crossbowmen. Crossbowmen, I feel like they're very, very good, both on the field, field battles, and both in sieges. They're just, they just wreck your shit up, man. Very, very good. And I prefer to have a um, army focused on crossbowmen. And their um, infantry, their legionnaires, are not that bad either. They're, if you want to employ skirmishers, uh, their infantry will also be uh, be able to spawn with throwing weapons. Uh, with mostly spears, and the Fierce Vein Huskarls will mostly spawn with throwing axes. So, take your pick. Although, the Huskarls are lit a tidbit higher on the level. Now, to the south, we have the, the Sharp Principalities. Yo, Victor in 21, and thank you for becoming a follower, dude. Uh, welcome to Hit Point End. My name is Raval. I'll be your bartender, and I hope you enjoy your stay. Drinks are on me. To the south, we have the Dashar. Uh, these guys are your Kurgits and Serenids into one from the native game. They have very their best horse archers out there, and I haven't employed horse archers. But if you activate the enhanced horse archer AI from the POP options over here. I understand that they're going to be doing a killer on the field of battle. I prefer it to be disabled because I'm not very fond of horse archers. Maybe I'm going to do a horse archer build another time. Okay, um, and now I wish to talk a tidbit about the mercenary troops, which in my playthroughs have been the stars of my armies. So, mercenary sharpshooters, mercenary sergeants, and... The mercenary cavalrymen have been pulling through for me. Uh, they're indeed a tidbit more expensive. Their weekly wages are expensive. 
Um, but the sh the sergeants are almost as strong as Huskarls from the Fierce Vein. Almost as strong. Maybe in some cases stronger. And they do spawn with throwing weapons. They spawn with both spears and axe throwing. And the mercenary sharpshooters are as good as the Empire Armored Crossbowmen. Uh, again, they're a tidbit more expensive. Uh, but you will be able to find them easier in taverns. And you'll be able to employ them in the early game pretty much too. Uh, the only downside for the mercenary sharpshooters that I've noticed is they do not have the pavish shields that the Empire Armored Crossbone have. And so their defense is a tidbit lower. But the damage is still up there and it's pre still pretty fucking sexy. So yes, more sharpshooters please since we're here. We already talked about the sergeants. Uh, mercenary cavalry, they're not the best out there. I feel like if you want the best cavalry, you can just hire some uh, knighthood orders to become your cavalry. Knight knighthood orders will be able to bring you the dough. Uh, but they're very, uh, very good, slightly on the cheaper option, and you can amass a mercenary cavalry army a tidbit faster. So those are my preferences. Those are the options that you can go for. Of course, um, I might not be 100% wrong. This is just from my experience, just from how much I played the game. And you can experiment with all of the troops around, especially since you have the troop trees at your disposal. Maybe when I explained the units i i maybe should have had this open <laughs> not gonna lie so going for example at the knighthood orders um from over here you can select exactly which are the best uh some of the best rangers are the silverman's ranger knighthood order and the rangers of the clarion call they are very good uh, mounted archers if you want the best melee uh you can go for the knights of the lion knights of the raven spear um radiant cross is also very good in battle uh, the Shadow Legion Centurions, anything that's mounted is going to be very, very good. And for uh, best infantry, Scorpion Assassins, Shadow Wolves, all are around that ballpark. So you'll be, uh, you're most likely going to be able to do what and decide exactly what you want to be joining based on your troop decision. I think that's going to be it for troops. Uh, for morale, though, I would like to mention something on morale. Uh, so you will have, you will need to keep an eye on morale. You won't be able to field super, super large armies. You'll need to ch keep an eye on food variety. Um, and it seems if we have, if you have the Shar, for example, right now we're murdering the, the Shar, uh, concrete, the last faction, um, that gives us a penalty of minus 120 to our, the Shar troops in our army. So keep that in mind. Uh, one way to fix things is to always have a baggage train in your inventory. This provides a lot of food and gives you the option to uh, field large armies and that gives you plus 60 to morale. To get this, you just need to go to any inn and ask for supplies from the innkeeper and he'll give you supplies in exchange for two various loots. And that's gonna fix all of your food problems and morale problems in the late game when you are fielding huge 400 to 600 army sizes okay so that's it on troops let's go and talk a little bit about weaponry a little bit about weaponry and in this way we're also going to slide in the qualis gems subject so looking at weaponry i wholeheartedly recommend that you not utilize swords and weapons that have cutting damage. In Prophecy of Pandor, uh, there are three, uh, actually in most mods, there are three types of damage, cutting, piercing, and uh, blunt weapons. Cutting does the most damage, but armor mitigates most of that damage. So swords and cutting damage is not effective against armor units. Piercing is very efficient against armored units, and it will murder them quite a bit. And then blunt damage receives the most bonus against armored units. So, for example, I have this Masterwork Battle Hammer with me. And besides dealing a shit ton of damage against armored units, it also knocks them out, and you'll be able to take them as prisoner after the battle. So, early game, please... Stay away from swords that 
or any any weapon and axes anything that has cutting damage acquire yourself the best blunt weapon that you can find or find a blunted lance if you want to go for a lance build and that's gonna gonna help you with the damage early game until you find qualis gems and you're gonna be able to acquire the hidden big strong weapons so what i utilized i found a battle hammer and upgraded to being a masterwork battle hammer and this is just beautiful in the early game so usually my setup for at least this build is i go when i'm on the field of battle i go my ruby rune sword which i'm going to be explaining in a tidbit gonna go two shields because uh, some of you people don't know this but if you have a shield on the back if you receive arrow fire from the back your shield can protect you so having this on my side on my back will help me against arrow fire and crossbow fire keep that in mind and then i have two weapons depending on the situation um for example if if i have a highly highly armored enemy i'm going to be utilizing a piercing weapon or a lance and if I just want to grab prisoners, I'm going to be using my battle hammer. And when I'm sieging, I simply replace my battle hammer and my second shield with my siege crossbow and steel crossbow. Of course, you can modify these. I'm just talk, uh, but to make it their, your own build, your own personal preference. This is what I'm doing. And this is why I've explained the three types of damage that you can do inside a game. Now, let's talk about the best weapons in the games. Among the best weapons in the game, you can find them at the Noldor with the Elves. And you can find them at the Hidden Mines of Alaziz. To acquire the best weapons in the game, you need three Qualis Gems. Qualis Gems are incredibly rare currency that you can utilize for a lot of different purposes inside the game. To help you out immensely you need a qualis gem to find the hidden location of the mines uh, the mines of alaziz are the location where they fabricate and you can acquire these weapons from once you, you reach the hidden mines you will need one qualis gem to receive the normal version of a strange ruined sword and then you need a second qualis gem to upgrade it to either the ruby as in our case, the ruby version of that sword, the sapphire version, or I think the third one was emerald. I'm not exactly sure what the third the third one is named, but I recommend that you grab a sword, and indeed it does have cutting damage, not gonna lie, but if you upgrade it to the ruby version, that cutting damage, as you can see on the swing, will be converted from cutting damage to piercing damage. And that, in my opinion, is the best one-handed sword in the game. Uh, besides that, you can also opt to go for a, a rune bow, a rune two-handed axe, a rune one-handed axe, rune swords, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I do feel like the ruby rune sword is one of the best out there. Of course, if you're going for an archer build, you're going to go for the rune bow. If you're going for a berserker build and prefer two-handed weapons, you're going to go for a two-handed build and so on and so forth. But you still need three qualis gems and I recommend you save those qualis gems at the, from the beginning of the game to the late game. Another thing, the biggest mistake that you can do with a qualis gem is sell it because after you acquired the best weapon in the game uh, your next investment into qualis gems should be into acquiring elixirs of hakon you can drink them at any time as long as you remember your thresholds for your agility strength and charisma drink three elixirs of hakon and then afterwards utilize those qualis gems to acquire um noldor troops and axes from laria or from the hidden elf city but we're going to be talking about the elves the noldors in a second here i'm trying to think if i covered everything in weapons uh speaking of armor um the best armor in the game you'll be you're going to be finding it at the elves and if you keep on with with the amount of looting that you have on your character you won't be able you won't be having any problems of finding very very good armor and loot so don't you worry about that i usually don't even go inside the shops to buy armor i just find it in the field of battle and i equip it that way okay so i guess now we could just talk about the early game and it, the exact steps 
and preparations that you need to make to make your own kingdom and start conquering the world. And the first step that you need to make from a level one is to start building enterprises. That's your major objective in the early game. Your major objective is to go to each town and build enterprises. Uh, the best enterprises that I've noticed that worked for me were dye works, tanneries, and oil presses. Um, mostly, if you if we're going to be going to the reports to the income section, income reports are new. No, 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 weekly budget, thank you. Um, I've mostly built dye works everywhere. I built a tannery in Llanos because the dye work uh, give me a smaller profit. And that's pretty much it. It will sometimes be randomized. You'll sometimes be receiving uh, a little bit more profit from tanneries or from oil presses. Keep an eye out for that. But your objective in the early game is to build as many enterprises as you can. And you acquire money to build these enterprises by just fighting, uh, going and doing tournaments. Uh, your looting skill will help you immensely with gathering a fortune. And another objective that you need to go for is hire, find and hire all companions. All of them. Remember when I said you just need to hire uh, the initial party and then once you make them vassals, you're going to go and hire the second party? No. You need to hire all of them because it's very important to go talk with the companion, ask them something, and you'll have the option uh, to ask them if they can support you in your qu conquest to be king. You then afterwards send them out and they're gather right to rule. Each companion, uh, no, I would, like, would not like to, I wanna get, each companion will give you and bring back three right to rule and some troops from their faction. So if we go to the character report over here, uh, right now I'm starting at 91 right to rule. To create your own faction, you would need a minimum of 30 right to rule. If you send out all of the companions, um, you'll be around 50 right to rule. And by that point, I think it's pretty, pretty safe that you can go and build your own faction if you so desire. Now, don't you worry. For example, if we are going to be hiring um, Adonia, or uh, if we're going to be hiring, no, not just Donovan, who will not be in our parties, you just send them out to gather right to rule, and afterwards, once they return, you just tell them, hey, we need to separate from for a while, and they're going to be gone. They're going to be gone, and you, they're going to be out of your hair, and you don't have to worry about them ever again. You just use them to gather right to rule for you. Now, keep in mind, if you go over 30 right to rule, it's going to be more difficult to join a faction as a vassal. Another way to acquire right to rule is um, by being inside a faction as a vassal, and each time they declare war or peace, you'll receive three right to rule. Another way is... Um, to marry a lady from a faction, and that's going to give you noble ties. And again, that's going to provide you another three uh, right to rule. So why is right to rule so important? Right to rule is, as the name suggests, uh, the recognition that you receive from the other factions. If you have a low right to rule, the other monarchs, the other kings, will, will not find you worthy of being amongst them. So they will most likely declare war and be in a permanent state of war with you. So if you want to have an incredibly, incredibly challenging time, sure, go for it, make your own kingdom. But if you want to be in, in a diplomatic, if you want to have diplomatic options with these factions, if you want to declare peace, if you want to declare other stuff with them, make sure you have at least 30 right to rule. That's going to help you out immensely. Um, I usually just wait until I have 50. That's what I do. Okay, um, after you've sent out all of the companions, remember, gather uh, the first party that I've mentioned before. Gather and start training your troops, training your companions to become vassals, the ones that I've mentioned, and then specialize the other four into becoming whatever your party lacks. And those four are Sarah, Leslie, uh, Diev, and Sigismund. That's what, what I went for. Once you've built, so the next step, once you've built enterprises all over the place, 
in each city afterwards and you've sent out all of the companions afterwards the next step sh for you should be to uh, befriend the Noldor now one of the objectives of the game one of the victory conditions is you need to have favorable or better relations with the Noldor at the start of the game you're going to be starting at a negative relation of I'm not sure if it's 30 or 15, but around that ballpark. It doesn't matter. It's a negative relation, and you'll need to befriend them. Noldor are some of the most frustrating troops that you can fight on the field of battle. They're practically OP, overpowered. They're very strong. Um, I don't recommend that you fight them, but there are three ways to um, acquire positive relations with the Noldor. One way is to read the books. You'll be able to find books that will increase your Noldor relations by 10, uh, if you read them. I do not recommend that because it's it's better to read those books when you're in the positive with the Noldor because it's going to be harder to acquire more relations once you get into positive with them. Another way to acquire relations with the Noldor, the second one, is to fight them, take them prisoner, and then release them. But that's, in my opinion, kind of suicide. It's very difficult to fight the Noldor and I do not recommend it. That is, I think, the dedicated, the, the devs intended that this way is the best way to acquire relations with them. I recommend against it. And I'm going to be recommending you the third option, which is helping them in battle. It's that easy. Um, they are going to be at war with you. You will need pathfinding for this. You'll need to follow Noldor troops around and bait them into fighting fighting other factions and then simply join the battle go on their side and help them in battle each battle will bring you uh, between one and four relations with them so think about it like this if you help them out in between 15 to 20 battles you will be in the positive and once you reach 15 relation with them and, and that's plus 15 if you're at sitting at 15 relations with them not at zero, 15, you're going to be able to receive a quest from Loria that's going to help you find the hidden city of Alacre, which is the Noldor city. And that's uh, very, very good, uh, very, very good to find because you're going to be able to um, participate in their Noldor tournament, which gives you uh, one of the prizes is a chance for you to acquire a Qualis gem, a 20% chance. But we're going to be, we're going to be going back to Alacre in a second uh you found the Noldor rep with without an army and it was super easy to not get caught in a fight with them yes yes that's also an option just have a small elite force you don't need a big army just to be fast on your feet run around and help them in battle it doesn't matter if they're fighting against sarleon or some other factions you can and if you get negative relations with them you can always go talk to a lord from one of their factions and pay a small fee a small fine uh to regain zero relations it shouldn't be a problem you should be perfectly fine and i feel like this is the best way to uh, gain relation with the noldor once you're in, in the positive uh with the noldor your next step is going to be to make relations with um a lot of good lords so let me explain a tidbit about that uh, by this point, you're either a vassal for one of the factions of your choosing, or at least you're a mercenary captain. Uh, if you don't want to join any of the factions, at least become a mercenary captain for one of the factions, because they will pay uh, the wages of your army, and it's very, very good. But at this point, you need to join a faction as a vassal, and you need to start participating in their wars and start befriending the lords. But you need to befriend the right lords. Let me explain. Let's go into the report section. We're going to go uh, and... No, actually go to notes, characters, and let's select a random lord. Okay, Bjorn Khan. Bjorn Khan's reputation is good-natured. There are... Um, all of lords will have reputations except faction kings. Faction kings do not have reputations because you can bring them to your side. Um, you will want to befriend as many martial, good-natured, benevolent, and if you so choose, cunning lords, because they will be able to come to your side. 
cunning lords it's kind of a little hard to deal with but just go for marshall marshall will will never complain they'll be incredibly loyal and they'll respect you if you have a lot of honor they do not give a fuck so what you need to do is when you're a vassal and you're battling let's let's say uh, i'm a vassal of the transylvanians free cities which is my kingdom but whatever let's say i'm a vassal and i'm fighting against the dashar each time i go into a battle against one of the enemies i will verify by clicking on their face while we're dialoguing to see exactly what type of reputation they have and if they're good natured or martial each time i defeat them i'm going to be releasing them because that's going to give me more honor and is going to increase relations with them and with the good natured and the martial lords that's going to increase it by quite a bit let me show you, for example, my faction, my uh, friend relations, known lords relations. As you can see, okay, so Ivanus, Bodice, Roland, Antonius, Jocelyn, Cavera. These are my um, vassals, but Rabban Khan is not one of mine. Rabban is on the Dashar territories, and we're sitting at 43 relations with him just by kicking his ass and not taking him as prisoner after battle, just releasing him. That's all. That's the best way to gain relations. Um, now, let's talk about the other lords, which are cunning, bad-tempered, sadistic, uh, bad motherfuckers. Those guys, you want to take them as many times as prisoners as you possibly can, because they're not going to be on the field of battle, and they're going to be staying away from your hair. Keep that in mind. Always take those guys as lords. Uh, let me show you an example. Notes, characters. Um... This guy, Bogdan Khan, is bad-tempered. Beat him up, take him as prisoner, and keep him inside your pens as much as possible. As much as possible. You can also do that with the Cunning Lords if you don't want to deal with it. As I mentioned with Lethal Durin, Lethal Durin is a Cunning Lord, but if you, if you give a Cunning Lord three fiefs, three fiefs, so that's a a town, a castle, and a city, or two villages and a castle. They will not bitch about it afterwards. They'll bitch if they have less than three fiefs, but if they have three fiefs or more, they will not bitch about your decisions. They'll be martial lords for you. Think of it like that. You can convert a cunning lord to a martial lord. It'll not change his reputation, but it will change the way he acts towards you as king or martial or a person. Okay, so I think that's it for lords and companions. Now, let's say you made friends. You made friends. You have a lot of strong friends and a lot of factions. And you have a lot of right to rule. You have a decent amount of troop size. You can increase your troop size by having charisma, leadership, and renown. Actually, if you go to reports, you can actually check the party size and it'll tell you exactly which things influence your party size because we have so much renown we can add 469 wink wink troops to my army to a grand total of 639 i think a good spot is 300 a sweet spot uh, if you have a party size of 300 you can go ahead and create your own kingdom now there are two ways um main ways of creating your own kingdom one way is you're already a vassal. You need to be part of a faction, a vassal of a faction. You keep on helping that faction conquer more and more cities, and you keep asking the king to give those cities or those castles to you, and eventually he'll refuse. He'll refuse. He needs to take care of other lords, and when he refuse, you can bitch about it, and you can ask, okay, fuck it. I'm going to rebel, and you'll, you'll have the option of rebelling and taking that castle for yourself, and this way starting your own kingdom and proclaiming yourself as a, your own. What I did was a little bit on the harder side. I uh, revoked my allegiance to the Ravenstorn. I was a Ravenstorn Lord. I decided to go to Lauria and attack and siege it on my own with the army that I had. And once I conquered Lauria, I declared my own faction. And speaking of which, I'm going to be mentioning a few locations where you can start your own kingdom and it's pretty easy. Lauria is a very good area, especially since you're near the Noldor Forest. These guys, if you're in the positive, will be protecting you. They will not attack your peasants, they will not attack your vassals, and they'll protect your lands from other factions, from bandits, from Jatu armies, 
and other minor faction stuff like that. They will protect your lands. So Laria is a good place to start. Another good place to start is from the northeast. Go Pointsbrook. Easily defendable. You have the Jatu to the south. So the Sarlin, it's going to be hard to march on you from there. And you'll just be able to expand westwards. And take the whole Ravenster for yourself. And it's going to be cool. Uh, Zaxxon, sign out if you go the rebellion option and if you're a female and have a husband, he will fight you until there until there's peace and then you can get him to join your kingdom. Okay, Zaxxon, thank you for the quick tip. Awesome. All right. Another good place is to start from Senderfall. Take Senderfall and then expand onwards. Um, some, some people on the internet also mentioned that it's a good idea to take Relic Keep and start dismantling the Empire from over here because Relic Keep is so easily defendable, but I do recommend that you grab a town. A town and keep it for yourself. And from there on, just start expanding. <clears throat> you will be at war with the faction that you're attacking, but if you have enough right to rule, the other factions will not declare war on you, and you'll just have to play uh, to face uh, the retaliation from the Starleon in this case. If we go to Laria, we're going to be talking about Let's say you started Laria as your kingdom. Once you take the town, the entirety of the Sarlion army or the faction will send their troops to take that city back. They're going to be pretty desperate about it. So you need to prepare. You need to garrison as many troops in, as you can in the castle as possible. And then kill the... Um, also, it would be a good idea to hire... Um, a mercenary company yes you have the option of hiring your own mercenary company that can follow you around or they can patrol your lands to help you out um let me check my income notes my weekly budget to see if yes for example we have the freighter Bruder. these are a medenheim mercenary company and they're sitting around and i order them to patrol the area around laria while i'm on the field of battle and defeating and dealing swift justice to any motherfucker that comes my way. Uh, you will be able to cho choose the color of your kingdom. You'll be able to choose the culture of your kingdom. You can make your kingdom be any of the factions. But besides the ones that I mentioned, you can also make them the Pendor culture. Now, Pendor culture is, in my opinion, the best culture. They're kind of a jack-of-all-trades uh, culture. And they have very good noble units. Uh, so the noble units surpass all of the other factions' units. They over-level them, and they're very strong. And they're very cheap to uphold, to maintain. Each uh, soldier needs to be paid. Each hold, and each soldier has a maintenance fee. But the bladesmen, for example, are very, very on the cheap side. So if you want to sustain your kingdom financially... And if you feel like you don't have enough money, well, because of the looting skills, you're most likely not have you're not gonna have this problem. I recommend that you go with the Pendor culture because you will be able to field a humongous army. Right now in Laria, I think we're having around 1,500 troops. Nobody's gonna be attacking Laria. Fucking nobody. And also you can talk with your steward inside the castle and tell them to recruit uh, soldiers from around the villages on their own on their own and they're automatically going to garrison and upgrade troops inside your city now um we're going to be talking about how to uh separate your fiefs among your lords what i recommend is you prioritize your companion lords the companions that you've trained up to become vassals make them vassals and give them um certain areas to defend to for example, when I started off, I had Laria, Erminade, Trugbrin, Sermish, and Quinn. These, this is one of my kingdom. And I started conquering Whitestag, Valor Shield, and made Julia, my for one of my companions, my vassal. And I gave both Valor Shield and Whitestag and the two um, villages under that control to her. This way, she'll have this area to protect. Don't give your vassals a uh, Valor Shield and then Longbeard Lodge because they'll need to protect both castles and they won't be able to be there at the same time. So try to give them uh, proximity, an area. For example, very simple. I gave this area to a lord. I gave this area to another lord. I gave this area to another lord and so on and so forth. Give them areas of influence they can easily 
easily um, defend. And as you get to the late game and you get stronger and stronger, this won't matter anymore. For example, I gave single to an, to a lord. I gave single to uh, I gave uh, Ishkoman to another. Uh, Saidu Sharif to another lord just to maintain a balance of relations between them because some um, as I said some uh, vassals won't like other vassals so they'll have relation problems if I give lethal Durin a castle maybe Jocelyn is gonna bitch about it you know so to maintain a balance I at late game you can just give whoever whatever you want because it won't matter anymore because in this case Torba uh, the Shar is gonna fall to us pretty pretty fucking soon and yeah i think that's pretty much it about kingdom kingdom um management i don't think i need to explain any more about that um another thing that i'm going to be touching upon is the city of alacre once you get into the city of alacre uh, there will be a tournament held at at the be beginning of each month uh, the first four days you can participate in the Noldor tournament. It's a difficult tournament, so I recommend that you save beforehand and try to win it as much as possible, because that's going to give you a Qualis gem. And Qualis gems, as we already talked, are very, very good currency. Um, besides that, I don't think I need to mention anything else in Alacre. Um, you can also, in Alacre, you'll also be able to buy Noldor equipment, you'll also be able to train your proficiencies. And your proficiencies are these depending on the weapon of your choice you can train them up and you can also uh, hire noldor troops if you have qualis gems and noldor pottery so keep that in mind too uh besides that i need to talk about the knighthood order a bit a tidbit now knighthood orders are uh as i mentioned unique units unique orders each uh knighthood order has a knight and sergeants in its service so for example the scorpion assassins have uh, scorpion assassins at night and the scorpion scion as sergeants scorpion scions are weaker units but of a different type to complement the strength to complement the weaknesses of your knights um, you can also create your own knighthood order and i wholeheartedly recommend that you not do the same mistake that i did uh, once you receive a castle or a town as a fief if you're a vassal of a faction, create a knighthood order as fast as possible because it takes a lot of money and a lot of training up to make them decent troops. So, for example, my knighthood order right here is the Blood Mist Guard. I made the Blood Mist Snipers. They're not well equipped. They're not um, very strong. The mistake that I made is that I made my knighthood order when I created my kingdom. So uh, once I conquered Laria, I made the knighthood order in Laria. So that didn't work out very well because I started utilizing Blitzkrieg tactics to conquer the entire world. And it didn't give enough time to my knighthood order to become the monsters that they can be. Um, you can infinitely train your knighthood order up. You can give them the best equipment, best type of armor, and they're going to be incredibly, incredibly strong. Um, how do you unlock the Noldor City? You got rep to zero in your game, but you haven't found it yet, but you know where it is from your game. Zaxxon, you can. Uh, you need to acquire 15 relations, not zero relations, 15 relations with the Noldor. And then you're going to go to Laria to Quickfen. He's going to give you the quest. To defeat a Jatu army inside the forest, and then you'll be able you'll be invited to allocate the Noldor City. That's how you unlock the Noldor City. Okay, and I'll need to talk a tidbit about unique spawns. So unique spawns are giant minor faction armies that can spawn that can spawn around, and if you defeat those minor faction armies that can field over 1,000 troops, so it's it's something insane like that. Uh, if you defeat them, you can capture their leader, and you can ask them for Qualis gems. So that's one way of gathering Qualis gems. Uh, and you need you need to keep an eye out for the Peasant Revolt army. If the Peasant Revolt army spawns, they're the weakest uh, unique spawn that you can defeat. And you can acquire a Qualis gem from it. Yo, Spectre. Hello. Welcome back to the stream, my good sir. How you doing, dude? So, yes. Um, that is pretty much it. If I 
didn't remember anything, please write it down in the comments. Uh, this is going to go on YouTube. Um, please write it down in the comments. I hope I've covered as many of the features as possible. I've, I hope I've, I covered everything. Another thing that you should do, you should always go to an inn and ask for rumors because rumors will give you hidden chests, which will contain a lot of cash and will help you move on and move forth. And for right now, we're going to be trying to acquire Torba, the final castle. And then we'll have world domination. After we're going to be having a world domination, um, w once we united the entire Pandora Kingdom, we're going to go and deal with the rest of the unique spawns as my victory, progress victory condition asks. As you can see, Sarleon, Ravenstern, Fearsbane, and the Bagas Ember have been destroyed in my playthrough using my tactics, and we just need to um, deal with the sharp principalities, and then we need to deal with the minor factions, because there are there are four armies spawned, the Snake Cult, the Vansiri, the Heretics, and I don't think we need to deal with the Inquisition army. Yes, uh, parties marked with the star are are not a victory condition, so we don't need to kill them. Uh, and we also need to kill Burgly the Usurper. And that way, we're going to be able to obliterate and destroy the minor factions, and we're going to be winning the game. The victory conditions are as following. Having one kingdom, which we're on our way, the Nondor must have a favorable or better relation with us, and then the Mist Mountain and every other faction must be obliterated or destroyed. Whew, that was a long, long talk. I think that's that's a hour, a hour long guide. I don't need to time time stamp it the fuck up, really. Uh, good for stream. You've been in a while. Can you burn the heretic army? Of course, I'm gonna be burning the heretic army. Only thing is the Red Brotherhood, uh, Red Hood Brotherhood map. Once you unlocked it, through a rumor, it has a Qualis gem. It is easily missable. Yes. Zaxxon's right. Uh, if you ask for rumors, you'll be able to receive a Red Brotherhood map. We also received a second Red Brotherhood map, which is near Ambershawn. So I'm going to be going around that area, and I'm going to be finding it. it gonna be, it's, it's guaranteed that you'll find a Qualis Gem in, inside the treasure chest. So as I said, ask for rumors, and I think that's it. Hope you enjoyed the guide, and... I hope to see you guys on my stream. I stream each day from Monday to Friday uh, for around seven hours um, at, what's, what's the time? Yes, at 11 a.m. East European Standard Time. So hope to see you guys there. Hit a like, hit a subscribe, and it'll help me out quite, quite a bit. Thank you.